Chapter Nineteen Face to Face in the Forest For a moment I could see nothing, for the glare of lanterns and torches caught me full in the eyes from the other side of the bridge. But soon the scene grew clear, and it was a strange scene. The bridge was in its place. At the far end of it stood a group of the Duke's servants. Two or three carried the lights which had dazzled me. Three or four held pikes in rest. They were huddled together. Their weapons were protruded before them. Their faces were pale and agitated. To put it plainly, they looked in as arrant a fright as I have seen men look, and they gazed apprehensively at a man who stood in the middle of the bridge, sword in hand. Rupert Hentzow was in his trousers and shirt. The white linen was stained with blood. But his easy, buoyant pose told me that he was himself either not touched at all or merely scratched. There he stood, holding the bridge against them, and daring them to come on, or rather bidding them send Black Michael to him. And they, having no firearms, cowered before the desperate man, and dared not attack him. They whispered to one another, and in the backmost rank I saw my friend Johann, leaning against the portal of the door, and staunching with a handkerchief the blood which flowed from a wound in his cheek. By marvellous chance I was master— the cravens would oppose me no more than they dared attack Rupert. I had but to raise my revolver, and I sent him to his account with his sins on his head. He did not so much as know that I was there. I did nothing. Why, I hardly know to this day. I had killed one man stealthily that night, and another by luck rather than skill. Perhaps it was that. Again, villain as the man was, I did not relish being one of a crowd against him. Perhaps it was that. But stronger than either of these restrained feelings came a curiosity and a fascination which held me spellbound, watching for the outcome of the scene. "'Michael, you dog! Michael, if you can stand, come on!' cried Rupert. And he advanced a step, the group shrinking back a little before him. "'Michael, you bastard, come on!' The answer to his taunts came in the wild cry of a woman. "'He's dead! My God, he's dead!' "'Dead?' shouted Rupert. "'I struck better than I knew!' And he laughed triumphantly. Then he went on. "'Down with your weapons there! I'm your master now! Down with them, I say!' I believe they would have obeyed. But as he spoke came new things. Firstly there arose a distant sound, as of shouts and knockings from the other side of the chateau. My heart leapt. It must be my men, come by a happy disobedience to seek me. The noise continued, but none of the rest seemed to heed it. Their attention was chained by what now happened before their eyes. The group of servants parted, and a woman staggered on to the bridge. Antoinette de Maubin was in a loose white robe. Her dark hair streamed over her shoulders, her face was ghastly pale, and her eyes gleamed wildly in the light of the torches. In her shaking hand she held a revolver, and as she tottered forward she fired it at Rupert Hentzow. The ball missed him, and struck the woodwork over my head. "'Faith, madam,' laughed Rupert, "'had your eyes been no more deadly than your shooting, I had not been in this scrape.' nor Black Michael in hell to-night. She took no notice of his words. With a wonderful effort she calmed herself till she stood still and rigid. Then, very slowly and deliberately, she began to raise her arm again, taking the most careful aim. He would be mad to risk it. He must rush on her, chancing the bullet, or retreat towards me. I covered him with my weapon. He did neither. Before she had got her aim— he bowed in his most graceful fashion, and cried, "'I can't kill where I've kissed,' and before she or I could stop him, laid his hand on the parapet of the bridge, and lightly leapt into the moat. At the very moment I heard a rush of feet, and a voice, I knew, Zapt's cry, "'God, it's the Duke, dead!' Then I knew that the King needed me no more, and throwing down my revolver, I sprang out on the bridge." There was a cry of wild wonder. The king! Then I, like Rupert Hentzow, sword in hand, vaulted over the parapet, intent on finishing my quarrel with him, where I saw his curly head fifteen yards off in the water of the moat. 
He swam swiftly and easily. I was weary and half crippled with my wounded arm. I could not gain on him. For a time I made no sound, but as we rounded the corner of the old keep, I cried, "'Stop, Rupert! Stop!' I saw him look over his shoulder, but he swam on. He was under the bank now, searching, as I guessed, for a spot that he could climb. I knew there to be none, but there was my rope, which would still be hanging where I left it. He would come to where it was before I could. Perhaps he would miss it, perhaps he would find it, and if he drew it up after him, he would get a good start on me. I put forth all my remaining strength, and pressed on. At last I began to gain on him, for he, occupied with his search, unconsciously slackened his pace. Ah! he had found it! A low shout of triumph came from him. He laid hold of it, and began to haul himself up. I was near enough to hear him mutter, "'Ah! Oh, the devil comes this here!' I was at the rope, and he, hanging in mid-air, saw me, but I could not reach him. "'Hello! Who's here?' he cried in startled tones. For a moment I believe he took me for the king. I dare say I was pale enough to lend colour to the thought. But an instant later he cried, "'Why, it's the play-actor! How came you here, man?' And so saying he gained the bank. I laid hand on the rope, but I paused. He stood on the bank, sword in hand, and he could cut my head open or spit me through the heart as I came up. I let go the rope. "'Never mind,' said I, "'but as I'm here, I think I'll stay.' He smiled down on me. "'These women are the deuce,' he began, when suddenly the great bell of the castle started to ring furiously, and a loud shout reached us from the moat. Rupert smiled again and waved his hand to me. "'I should like a turn with you, but it's a little too hot,' said he, and he disappeared from above me. In an instant, without thinking of danger, I laid my hand to the rope. I was up. I saw him thirty yards off, running like a deer towards the shelter of the forest. For once Rupert Hentzau had chosen discretion for his part. I laid my feet to the ground and rushed after him, calling to him to stand. He would not— Unwounded and vigorous, he gained on me at every step. But forgetting everything in the world except him and my thirst for his blood, I pressed on, and soon the deep shades of the forest of Zender engulfed us both, pursued and pursuer. It was three o'clock now, and day was dawning. I was on a long, straight grass avenue, and a hundred yards ahead ran young Rupert, his curls waving in the fresh breeze. I was weary and panting. He looked over his shoulder and waved his hand again to me. He was mocking me, for he saw that he had the pace of me. I was forced to pause for breath. A moment later Rupert turned sharply to the right and was lost from my sight. I thought it was all over, and in deep vexation sank on the ground. But I was up again directly, for a scream rang through the forest, a woman's scream. Putting forth the last of my strength, I ran on to the place where he had turned out of my sight and turning also I saw him again. But alas, I could not touch him. He was in the act of lifting a girl down from her horse. Doubtless it was her scream that I heard. She looked like a small farmer's or a peasant's daughter, and she carried a basket on her arm. Probably she was on her way to the early market at Zender. Her horse was a stout, well-shaped animal. Master Rupert lifted her down amid her shrieks. The sight of him frightened her, but he treated her gently, laughed, kissed her, and gave her money. Then he jumped on the horse, sitting sideways like a woman, and then he waited for me. I, on my part, waited for him. Presently he rode toward me, keeping his distance, however. He lifted up his hand, saying, "'What did you in the castle?' "'I killed three of your friends,' said I. "'What? You got to the cells?' "'Yes.' "'And the king? "'He was hurt by Detchard before I killed Detchard, "'but I pray that he lives.' "'You fool,' said Rupert pleasantly. "'One more thing I did. "'And what's that? "'I spared your life. "'I was behind you on the bridge with a revolver in my hand. "'No, faith, I was between two fires. "'Get off your horse,' I cried, "'and fight like a man. "'Before a lady?' said he, pointing to the girl. "'Fie, your majesty!' 
Then, in my rage, hardly knowing what I did, I rushed at him. For a moment he seemed to waver. Then he reined his horse in and stood waiting for me. On I went in my folly. I seized the bridle and I struck at him. He parried and thrust at me. I fell back a pace and rushed in at him again, and this time I reached his face and laid his cheek open and darted back before he could strike me. He seemed almost mazed at the fierceness of my attack. Otherwise I think he must have killed me. I sank on my knee, panting, expecting him to ride at me, and so he would have done, and then and there I doubt not one or both of us would have died. But at the moment there came a shout from behind us, and looking round I saw, just at the turn of the avenue, a man on a horse. He was riding hard, and he carried a revolver in his hand. It was Fritz von Thalenheim, my faithful friend. Rupert saw him and knew that the game was up. He checked his rush at me and flung his leg over the saddle, but yet, just for a moment, he waited. Leaning forward, he tossed the hair off his forehead and smiled and said, "'Au revoir, Rudolf Rassendil.' Then, with his cheeks streaming blood, but his lips laughing and his body swaying with ease and grace, he bowed to me, and he bowed to the farm-girl, who had drawn near in trembling fascination." and he waved his hand to Fritz, who was just within range, and let fly a shot at him. The ball came nigh doing its work, for it struck the sword he held, and he dropped the sword with an oath, wringing his fingers, and clapped his heels hard on his horse's belly, and rode away at a gallop. And I watched him go down the long avenue, riding as though he rode for his pleasure, and singing as he went, for all that there was that gash in his cheek. Once again he turned to wave his hand, and then the gloom of the thickets swallowed him, and he was lost from our sight. Thus he vanished, reckless and wary, graceful and graceless, handsome, debonair, vile, and unconquered, and I flung my sword passionately on the ground, and cried to Fritz to ride after him. But Fritz stopped his horse, and leapt down, and ran to me, and knelt, putting his arm about me. And indeed it was time, for the wound that Detchard had given me was broken forth afresh, and my blood was staining the ground. "'Then give me the horse!' I cried, staggering to my feet and throwing his arms off me. And the strength of my rage carried me so far as where the horse stood, and then I fell prone beside it, and Fritz knelt by me again. "'Fritz!' I said. "'Ay, friend, dear friend,' said he, tender as a woman. "'Is the king alive?' He took his handkerchief and wiped my lips and bent, and kissed me on the forehead. "'Thanks to the most gallant gentleman that lives,' said he softly, "'the king is alive.' The little farm-girl stood by us, weeping for fright and wide-eyed for wonder, for she had seen me at Zender, and was I not pallid, dripping, foul and bloody as I was, yet was not I the king? And when I heard that the king was alive, I strove to cry, "'Hurrah!' but I could not speak, and I laid my head back in Fritz's arms, and closed my eyes, and I groaned, and then, lest Fritz should do me wrong in his thoughts, I opened my eyes, and tried to say hurrah again, but I could not, and being very tired, and now very cold, I huddled myself close up to Fritz to get the warmth of him, and shut my eyes again, and went to sleep. Chapter Twenty, The Prisoner and the King. In order to have a full understanding of what had occurred in the castle of Zender, it is necessary to supplement my account of what I myself saw and did on that night by relating briefly what I afterwards learnt from Fritz and from Madame de Maubin. The story told by the latter explained clearly how it happened that the cry which I had arranged as a stratagem and a sham had come in dreadful reality before its time, and had thus, as it seemed at the moment, ruined our hopes, while in the end it had favoured them. The unhappy woman, fired, I believe, by a genuine attachment to the Duke of Strelsau, no less than by the dazzling prospects which a dominion over him opened before her eyes, had followed him at his request from Paris to Ruritania. He was a man of strong passions, but of stronger will, and his cool head ruled both. He was content to take all and give nothing. 
When she arrived, she was not long in finding that she had a rival in the Princess Flavia. Rendered desperate, she stood at nothing which might give or keep for her her power over the Duke. As I say, he took and gave not. Simultaneously, Antoinette found herself entangled in his audacious schemes. Unwilling to abandon him, but bound to him by the chains of shame and hope, yet she would not be a decoy, nor, at his bidding, lure me to death. Hence the letters of warning she had written. Whether the lines she sent to Flavia were inspired by good or bad feeling, by jealousy or by pity, I do not know. But here also she served us well. When the Duke went to Zenda she accompanied him, and here for the first time she learnt the full measure of his cruelty, and was touched with compassion for the unfortunate king. From this time she was with us. Yet, from what she told me, I know that she still, as women will, loved Michael, and trusted to gain his life, if not his pardon, from the king, as the reward for her assistance. His triumph she did not desire, for she loathed his crime, and loathed yet more fiercely what would be the prize of it, his marriage with his cousin, Princess Flavia. At Zender new forces came into play, the lust and daring of young Rupert. He was caught by her beauty, perhaps. Perhaps it was enough for him that she belonged to another man, and that she hated him. For many days there had been quarrels and ill-will between him and the Duke, and the scene which I had witnessed in the Duke's room was but one of many. Rupert's proposals to me, of which she had, of course, been ignorant, in no way surprised her when I related them. She had herself warned Michael against Rupert, even when she was calling on me to deliver her from both of them. On this night, then, Rupert had determined to have his will. When she had gone to her room, he, having furnished himself with a key to it, had made his entrance. Her cries had brought the Duke, and there, in the dark room, while she screamed, the men had fought, and Rupert, having wounded his master with a mortal blow, had, on the servants rushing in, escaped through the window, as I have described. The Duke's blood, spurting out, had stained his opponent's shirt, but Rupert, not knowing that he had dealt Michael his death, was eager to finish the encounter. How he meant to deal with the other three of the band I know not. I dare say he did not think, for the killing of Michael was not premeditated. Antoinette, left alone with the Duke, had tried to staunch his wound, and thus was she busied till he died, and then, hearing Rupert's taunts, she had come forth to avenge him. Me she had not seen, nor did she, till I darted out of my ambush, and left after Rupert into the moat. The same moment found my friends on the scene. They had reached the chateau in due time, and waited ready by the door. But Johann, swept with the rest to the rescue of the Duke, did not open it. Nay, he took a part against Rupert, putting himself forward more bravely than any in his anxiety to avert suspicion, and he had received a wound in the embrasure of the window. Till nearly half-past two, Zapt waited. Then, following my orders, he had sent Fritz to search the banks of the moat. I was not there. Hastening back, Fritz told Zapt, and Zapt was for following orders still, and riding at full speed back to Tarlenheim, while Fritz would not hear of abandoning me, let me have ordered what I would. On this they disputed some few minutes. Then Zapt, persuaded by Fritz, detached a party under Bernenstein to gallop back to Tarlenheim and bring up the marshal, while the rest fell to on the great door of the chateau. For several minutes it resisted them. Then— just as Antoinette de Maubin fired at Rupert Hentzau on the bridge, they broke in, eight of them in all, and the first door they came to was the door of Michael's room, and Michael lay dead across the threshold, with a sword thrust through his breast. Zapt cried out at his death, as I had heard, and they rushed on to the servants, but these, in fear, dropped their weapons, and Antoinette flung herself weeping at Zapt's feet, and all she cried was that I had been at the end of the bridge— and had leapt off. "'What of the prisoner?' asked Zapt, but she shook her head. Then Zapt and Fritz, with the gentleman behind them, crossed the bridge, slowly, warily, and without noise, and Fritz stumbled over the body of de Gote in the way of the door. They felt him, and found him dead. Then they consulted, listening eagerly for any sound from the cells below. 
but there came none, and they were greatly afraid that the king's guards had killed him, and, having pushed his body through the great pipe, had escaped the same way themselves. Yet, because I had been seen here, they had still some hope, thus indeed Fritz in his friendship told me, and going back to Michael's body, pushing aside Antoinette, who prayed by it, they found a key to the door which I had locked, and opened the door. The staircase was dark, and they would not use a torch at first, lest they should be the more exposed to fire. But soon Fritz cried, "'The door down there is open. See, there is light.' So they went on boldly, and found none to oppose them. And when they came to the outer room, and saw the Belgian, Bersonin, lying dead, they thanked God, zapped, saying, "'Aye, he has been here.' Then, rushing into the king's cell, they found Dechar lying dead across the dead physician, and the king on his back with his chair by him. And Fritz cried, "'He's dead!' And Zapp drove all out of the room except Fritz, and knelt down by the king. And, having learnt more of wounds and the signs of death than I, he soon knew that the king was not dead, nor, if properly attended, would die." and they covered his face, and carried him to Duke Michael's room, and laid him there. And Antoinette rose from praying by the body of the Duke, and went to bathe the king's head and dress his wounds, till a doctor came. And Zapt, seeing I had been there, and having heard Antoinette's story, sent Fritz to search the moat and then the forest. He dared send no one else. And Fritz pounded my horse, and feared the worst. Then, as I have told, he found me— guided by the shout with which I had called on Rupert to stop and face me, and I think a man has never been more glad to find his own brother alive than was Fritz to come on me, so that in love and anxiety for me he thought nothing of a thing so great as would have been the death of Rupert Hentzow. Yet, had Fritz killed him, I should have grudged it. The enterprise of the King's rescue being thus prosperously concluded— it lay on Colonel Zapt to secure secrecy as to the king ever having been in need of rescue. Antoinette de Maubin and Johann the keeper, who indeed was too much hurt to be wagging his tongue just now, were sworn to reveal nothing, and Fritz went forth to find, not the king, but the unnamed friend of the king, who had lain in Zender and flashed for a moment before the dazed eyes of Duke Michael's servants on the drawbridge. The metamorphosis had happened, and the king, wounded almost to death by the attacks of the jailers who guarded his friend, had at last overcome them, and rested now, wounded but alive, in Black Michael's own room in the castle. There he had been carried, his face covered with a cloth from the cell, and orders issued that if his friend were found he should be brought directly and privately to the king, and that meanwhile messengers should ride at full speed to Tarlenheim to tell Marshal Strakentz to assure the princess of the king's safety, and to come himself with all speed to greet the king. The princess was enjoined to remain at Tarlenheim, and there await her cousin's coming, or his further injunctions. Thus the king would come to his own again, having wrought brave deeds, and escaped almost by a miracle the treacherous assault of his unnatural brother. This ingenious arrangement of my long-headed old friend prospered in every way, save where it encountered a force that often defeats the most cunning schemes. I mean nothing else than the pleasure of a woman. For let her cousin and sovereign send what command he chose, or Colonel Zapp chose for him, and let Marshal Strakentz insist as he would, the Princess Flavia was in no way minded to rest at Tarlenheim, while her lover lay wounded at Zender, and when the Marshal, with a small suite, rose forth from Tarlenheim on the way to Zender, the princess's carriage followed immediately behind, and in this order they passed through the town where the report was already rife that the king, going the night before to remonstrate with his brother in all friendliness, for that he held one of the king's friends in confinement in the castle, had been most traitoriously set upon, that there had been a desperate conflict, that the duke was slain with several of his gentlemen, and that the king, wounded as he was, had seized and held the castle of Zender. All of which talk made, as may be supposed, a mighty excitement, and the wires were set in motion, and the tidings came to Strelsau, only just after orders had been sent thither to parade the troops, and over all the dissatisfied quarters of the town with a display of force. Thus the Princess Flavia came to Zender, 
and as she drove up the hill with the marshal riding by the wheel, and still imploring her to return in obedience to the king's orders, Fritz von Thalenheim, with the prisoner of Zender, came to the edge of the forest. I had revived from my swoon, and walked, resting on Fritz's arm, and looking out from the cover of the trees I saw the princess. Suddenly understanding, from a glance at my companion's face, that we must not meet her, I sank on my knees behind a clump of bushes. But there was one whom we had forgotten, but who had followed us, and was not disposed to let slip the chance of earning a smile, and maybe a crown or two. And while we lay hidden, the little farm-girl came by us, and ran to the princess, curtsying and crying, "'Madame, the king is here, in the bushes. May I guide you to him, madame?' "'Nonsense, child,' said old Strakens. "'The king lies wounded in the castle.' "'Yes, sir, he's wounded, I know, but he's there, with Count Fritz, and not at the castle,' she persisted. "'Is he in two places, or are there two kings?' asked Flavia, bewildered. "'And how should he be here?' "'He pursued a gentleman, madame, and they fought till Count Fritz came, and the other gentleman took my father's horse from me and rode away.' "'but the king is here with Count Fritz. "'Why, madame, is there another man in Ruritania like the king?' "'No, my child,' said Flavia softly. "'I was told it afterwards. "'And she smiled and gave the girl money. "'I will go and see this gentleman.' "'And she rose to alight from the carriage. "'But at this moment Zapt came riding from the castle, "'and seeing the princess made the best of a bad job, and cried to her that the king was well tended and in no danger. "'In the castle?' she asked. "'Where else, madame?' said he, bowing. "'But this girl says he is yonder with Count Fritz.' Zapp turns his eyes on the child with an incredulous smile. "'Every fine gentleman is a king to such,' said he. "'Why, he's as like the king as one pea to another, madame,' cried the girl, a little shaken but still obstinate. Zapp started round. The old marshal's face asked unspoken questions. Flavia's glance was no less eloquent. Suspicion spreads quick. "'I'll ride myself and see this man,' said Zapp hastily. "'Nay, I'll come myself,' said the princess. "'Then come alone,' he whispered. And she, obedient to the strange hinting in his face, prayed the marshal and the rest to wait— and she and Zapt came on foot towards where we lay, Zapt waving to the farm-girl to keep at a distance. And when I saw them coming, I sat in a sad heap on the ground, and buried my face in my hands. I could not look at her. Fritz knelt by me, laying his hand on my shoulder. "'Speak low, whatever you say,' I heard Zapt whisper as they came up. And the next thing I heard was a low cry, half of joy, half of fear, from the princess. "'It is he! Are you hurt?' And she fell on the ground by me, and gently pulled my hands away, but I kept my eyes to the ground. "'It is the king,' she said. "'Pray, Colonel Zapp, tell me where lay the wit of the joke you played on me?' We answered none of us. We three were silent before her. Regardless of them, she threw her arms round my neck and kissed me. Then Zapt spoke, in a low, hoarse whisper, "'It is not the king. Don't kiss him. He is not the king.' She drew back for a moment. Then, with an arm still round my neck, she asked in superb indignation, "'Do I not know my love? Rudolph, my love!' "'It is not the king,' said old Zapt again, and a sudden sob broke from tender-hearted Fritz. It was the sob that told her no comedy was afoot. "'He is the king,' she cried. "'It is the king's face, the king's ring, my ring. It is my love.' "'Your love, madame,' said old Zapt. "'But not the king. The king is there in the castle. This gentleman—' "'Look at me, Rudolph, look at me,' she cried, taking my face between her hands. "'Why do you let them torment me? Tell me what it means.' Then I spoke, gazing into her eyes. "'God forgive me, madame,' I said. "'I am not the king.' I felt her hands clutch my cheeks. She gazed at me as never man's face was scanned yet. And I, silent again, saw wonder born, and doubt grow, and terror spring to life as she looked. 
and very gradually the grasp of her hand slackened. She turned to Zapt, to Fritz, and back to me. Then suddenly she reeled forward and fell in my arms, and with a great cry of pain I gathered her to me and kissed her lips. Zapt laid his hand on my arm. I looked up in his face, and I laid her softly on the ground and stood up, looking on her, cursing heaven that young Rupert's sword had spared me for this sharper pang.'